Brooke Martin is a warrior, plain and simple. When you hear what she's endured, you'll understand why I call her that. She recently left a long and successful career as an award-winning broadcast news anchor. She's now speaking and writing, really encouraging people who need to reconnect with hope. In 2019, Brooke came to national prominence at the birth and immediate death of her second child, who had a rare birth defect. The thing that's so wild about it is that Brooke knew this would happen. She learned very early in her pregnancy the child had zero chance of survival. Yet she still carried Emma Noel full term. That loss and the coverage that it brought set her on a path to help others find courage in life's hardest moments. She does it by teaching people how to burn away what doesn't serve them. This is my longtime friend, Brooke Martin, the fire starter. Okay, I like to play a little game, Brooke. Mm. You ready to play a game? Ready. Okay, it's just a series of questions. The only rule is that you just have to be truthful. Okay. You think you can do it? I think I can do it. Okay. When was the best time in your life? Best time in my life this summer. I was sitting on our deck outside. My daughter was napping. I had the monitor playing. <laughs> the sun was shining. The breeze was blowing. My husband and son were on our little pond in a kayak. And... I was hit with this wave of gratitude. Oh. And I just thought, this is life. Mm. This is it. This is everything that I want. And it was the first time, ironically, that I had chosen to step away from what I had been working my whole life for. Mm. And that was my career. And so I stepped away, took some time off, and it was in that moment when I was just hit with happiness. And it doesn't mean it was because the job was not there, but my perspective was shifting. Mm. And I just started to understand the simple things right. are where it's at. When was the worst time in your life? March 15th, 2019. And that was the day that I said hello and goodbye to my daughter, Emma Noel. We'll get into that. When was a turning point for you in your life that you can say from that moment, everything changed? Junior year of college, um, I went to Temple University. I was studying broadcasting, um, but I was chasing the wrong things. And I came to a point my junior year where I just felt empty. Mm. Um, and I didn't know where to go. Um, it may have been depression. Um, it wasn't diagnosed, but I just felt uh, something's missing. And totally ironically, at that time, my mom sent me a book in the mail called Purpose Driven Life. Mm. And it's a 40-day read uh, that you go through and discover, I think the subtitle is, Why on Earth Am I Here? And it changed my life. And I didn't even tell her I was reading it. <laughs> and after the 40 days, I had so much awareness of God's patience and grace for me that I wanted nothing but to just give it back. Mm. But I had nothing. I was broke. <laughs> You're in college. <laughs> I'm in college. And I remember thinking, I have spring break coming up. And so I said, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go somewhere. I'm going to do a missions trip. I'm going to do this. And so I looked at everything. Nothing was aligning. About two weeks before, I thought, I'll just go home, work at the, the homeless shelter, do something. I'll just do something. And my mom calls again, totally unaware. And she says, I know this is crazy. You're never going to do this. But there are two spots on a missions trip to Mexico from this state to this state. And it was exactly my spring break. And I said, say no more. Yeah. Just sign me up. Yeah. That week I served and just was with people and understood that um, there is so much more depth and beauty in serving than in receiving, and especially as college kids, right? I mean, it's all about me. <laughs> well, college is supposed to be the exploration it of is. you. But what it turns into instead of exploration is a self-serving, mm -hmm. and that's different. Um, and I think that self-exploration comes through giving, mm -hmm. and it's where we get it wrong a lot. And the last day I was there, I climbed up to the top of this hill all by myself, and in the most guttural prayer, I said the most simple words and I just threw my hands up and I just said, God, use me. 
And I had no idea what that <laughs> meant. I had no idea what that would look like, but it, I don't think I've ever uttered anything that I felt more. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, that has just driven my life. It's like, it doesn't matter if I'm a mom at home. It doesn't matter if I'm, you know, in knee deep in my career, God use me. And that was really a clarifying moment for my life that junior year. Oh my gosh, I love that. What's something about your nature that you've either, either overcome or continue to overcome? Mm, continuing to overcome, definitely have not overcome it, but um, people pleasing. Uh, I think it is a combination of just natural um, upbringing, um, just kind of personality, and then a job of being a TV news anchor for 15 years. Yeah. Um, you know, it all kind of combines to make you care a lot about what other people think. Mm -hmm. And there are some benefits to it, but when it becomes um, your sole focus or it becomes the loudest voice, mm -hmm. um, it's a problem. And you start to make decisions based on things that um, are not sustainable and um, are simply limiting and to yourself and to who you were created to be. And I have made many ill decisions like based on fear of how it would be perceived or what, it, you know, when in reality, it's like, man, this is all we've got. Yeah. We've got this one shot. Like we need to say it, we need to do it. Yeah. And we need to not be scared of what other people think. And that's been crippling for me in certain areas. And so that's what I'm, I'm working. It's a process, yeah. but, um, to shed identities that we've worked so long to build. You know, I, I think so many of us have worked, 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 worked to get to this place. And then we realize, but that's not me. Mm. What is me? And so overcoming the fear of man has been a really big challenge in my life. Uh, what do you find yourself saying a lot lately? Like, is there a phrase or certain words that you just find are always coming out of your mouth? There is more for us. Mm. I, I talk to people all the time. I love talking to people. I love hearing stories. And I have a, a really deep sense that people are longing for more. Mm. And, um, I, my personal exploration of that has led to such rich and deep waters. And I feel like I'm just scratching the surface with it, but I'm like, wow, <laughs> like there is so much more here. Yeah. Like, let's find it. And it, you know, it, I think it, it seeps into every area of life, mm -hmm. um, rest, work, family, um, just time management. Yeah. But, um, but there is a, a depth of, of God's purpose in our lives that if we dig in and we start to pursue, he is very quick to meet us in. What do you think your purpose is? I think that my purpose is to glorify God. And that sounds almost self-righteous and that's not my intent. But I think of it as R.C. Sproul is a theologian and he said something to the effect of in a culture that is so focused on doing over being, we must value who we're becoming. And it's only in our being that we find what we should be doing. Hmm. And so I think that glorifying God is really just a path of finding out who we were created to be. Hmm. I think of it like if a carver made a, a flute and the flute goes around and tries to figure out what am I, for, you know, what am I made for? And it tries to be a pencil and it doesn't work. And it tries to be a baseball bat and it doesn't or a crutch, work. Maybe or it could a be a cane or... or a cane <laughs> or a cigar. And <laughs> that's uh, not what it's meant for. <laughs> um, and yeah, and it, and it feels frustrated and it feels unfulfilled. The only way the flute knows what it was made for is to go to the carver mm. and say, what did you create me to be? And then when it finds out that it's made to make beautiful music, not only is it fulfilled, but it's glorifying its creator. Mm. And the creator's saying, that's exactly what I created mm. you for. But so often we try and we strive. What is my purpose? What I got, I got yeah, to figure yeah, yeah. this out. We try out. to push it, right? Push yes. it when it's not supposed to be pushed. And, and you know, there's so much that God talks about, like my yoke is easy, my burden is like, like just come, like mm. sit on my lap, like, I'll, I'll, t I'll talk to you. I'll whisper of you like what I made you to be. And, um, and that's, that's really what my purpose is now is just finding out like, yeah. God, what is it that you created me to be? When did you realize that, that that was the purpose? Um, it's been a journey, you know, I think, uh, a journey of faith, um, that I've had to realize, um, a lot on my own, in my adulthood, I'd had to shake away a lot of hurt 
through um, faith and through religious institutions and um, it came it, it came in in waves mm. but when I took away the striving and I really um, went to the scriptures and I looked at the person of Jesus and I said what was he like mm. and it's so different from so much of what we as you know uh, American Christianity or whatever. it's it, it can be so different from that and I think we're getting it really wrong in a lot of areas mm -hmm. and I had to um, disassemble things that I had you know um, thought I understood and really take it from the basics and um, and so it's been a process it wasn't like an enlightening moment the, but the more that I grow to know the person of Jesus the more I am absolutely um, overwhelmed mm. by the personal and intimate relationship that is available for all of us. Mm -hmm. And it is only in that relationship that I have found purpose and fulfillment because I found who I'm supposed to be. Yeah. So um, it's a journey, yeah. um, but one that I am like so excited to mm. be on. Yeah, so let's start there. Yeah. Let's start there about about excitement. Mm -hmm. um, did television news excite you ever? Was yes. there a time that it was exciting? Absolutely. It's what I always wanted to do. I visited all my schools for interior design, and then um, a counselor I remember at one point saying, "Is this your passion?" Mm. And I thought, "Well, it's more of a hobby." And he said, "What do you love to do?" And I. I anchored our high school's <laughs> announcements <laughs> yeah. in the morning. Yes. And I said, Today is April 8th. <laughs> and then student council today. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, you know, like, that's it. Uh, and, and it was just like that. Never looked back. And I loved it. I loved um, the industry. I loved the storytelling. Mm -hmm. I loved the journalism. I loved being on TV. I loved yeah. it all. Um, and you kind of walk through an industry and as as one in TV news, you know that a lot is out of your control. Yeah. Um, and so it, it took twists and turns that I didn't see coming, some good, some bad. And it got to a point where um, the industry was changing so fast mm. in such a way that did not align with why I got into the industry. Yeah. Um, but I, I loved the 15 years that I was in news. I loved it. I loved being a mouthpiece for, yeah. for a community. Was there ever a point where you said this just isn't fulfilling or this isn't exciting anymore? Was there like a moment mm. or do you feel like there was just kind of this slow dissipation? Slow dissipation, I think. Um, with every new ownership that comes, changes are made. Um, more demands are put on the people. Um, less time is given for certain things. And, you know, my favorite things were more long, in-depth mm, like pieces. This. Like, like this. this. Long conversations, telling a story. Yeah. yeah. This, is, this is really what matters. And um, because of cuts and resources and yeah. everything else, those were just... Um, slowly, you know, eliminated. And I got to a point where I was anchoring four hours of news, just mm -hmm. the same news over yeah. and over and over. And I just thought this isn't, this isn't why I got into the, to the mm -hmm. industry. And it certainly is not feeling fulfilling. And it was about a year ago that I just started to say, I, I, I just say it was an uprooting. Mm -hmm. I just felt like something in my heart was like, there's something coming. Yeah. And I had, achieved my what I had set out to achieve. It was my dream job in a city I loved. And I just thought, really? Like nothing terrible had happened. Things were changing, but like, what is this? Yeah. Did, and, was it an unsettled feeling? What did you feel? It was, yes, it was an unsettled feeling. I don't even know if I can verbalize it. It was just like, this isn't, I'm not finding the fulfillment in this like I did yeah. and why and what is it? And I vowed to just kind of take the next season to do some soul searching and to have some conversations with trusted people and figure out yeah. what, what is, is this? this? Yeah. Um, and, you know, and that's a scary place to get because I think so many times we get to these places and you're like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I've worked too hard for this. I've, you know, yeah. moved too many times for this. My poor family. My poor family. <laughs> Um, you know, there's too much on, on the line. Yeah. Um, and we don't even allow ourselves to go into those dreaming um, mm. seasons and dreaming seasons are so important mm. because we just allow the whisper of our creator yeah. to say, this is where I have you right now. This is where I want to bring you. And it became more and more clear with every month that I moved through it, that, that this chapter was coming to an end. And at what point did you 
talk to your husband about mm -hmm. that. Like, I mean, because he's been on this journey yeah. with you, you know? Yeah. And at what point did you say, this is going to sound crazy, but mm -hmm. here's where, I, here's what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. At what point did you involve him in, in that like emotion? I think I involved him right away with just, you know, I feel like this is weird, you know, I just kind of yeah. feel this. Um, and then really not much more until I had a conversation with a friend who, um, connected me with uh, somebody who whose job it is to take people with messages and to get the message out and to create mm. a platform to get this message out. And at first I was really, I was like, this is not like part of me, honestly, Lauren wanted to dig a hole and farm 20 acres and mm. not see the public anymore. <laughs> and just Are we the same person. Like, I feel like <laughs> this is the conversation just one year ago, my husband and I said, I said, can I just get, can we just leave? Yeah. Can I just leave? Like sometimes yes. it gets really, really stinking hard. It does. And you just want to like give up on everything and go live off a farm on, off the land. Yeah. Right? Like with, take your kids and just go. Yeah. The, the spotlight turns from shining to burning, you mm -hmm. know, and you're just like, I just, I want to be, be done with it. And, um, and so when I connected with this woman and we had a conversation, um, she, she kind of walked me through and she said, you know, just, just think about it. And I was driving and I, I just said, God, I said, if, if this is something I need inspiration, cause I don't want, we walked through something incredibly hard and I feel like I learned such incredible lessons from it. And I said, but I don't want to use this. Like, mm. I know you gave it to us to steward and to use, but I don't want to use it. And, um, and I said, if, if this is something that you have for people, like that you want them to hear. I need inspiration and I need vision. And in that moment, I just saw a, just an image in my mind of a burned out forest. I mean, just crisp. And I just heard the term controlled burn. And I was like, what is this? And, and as I'm thinking and praying and just talking to God, he's starting to put the pieces together. And he's saying, you know, we have all been created in my image, like beautiful humans, beautiful people with potential. And because of life's upbringing and trials and everything else, you know, weeds have grown in our, in our forests, in our Edens. And it is only through pain and suffering, uh, an act of a controlled burn mm. that can burn us to our core, but it also burns away the weeds. And what it leads to is soil, ashy soil that has the nutrients and the richness to afford beautiful regrowth mm -hmm. that never could have grown without the fire. Right. And so how do we approach life's fires in a way that has purpose, that has mm -hmm. meaning, and mostly that has hope? Yeah. And it just this, and, and so I just thought, oh, oh God, this oh, is big. This oh, I, is didn't, big. I didn't expect this. Like, <laughs> uh, I, and, and so, you know, I'm just like, right. I'm like, wow, this is something. And I'm like, okay. I, and I, I remember going to my husband and I said, all right, just, just stick with me for a second. Um, <laughs> I got, I got this vision. I got this vision. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to quit my job. No, I just said, I need time really yeah. was what it came down to. And, um, I mean, anxiety played a role at this point. Like part of my process, like I just became uncomfortable doing what I was doing on camera. Like I could have talked for hours on camera, um, you know, a year ago. And then all of a sudden I started like dealing with anxiety. Was and... it because it didn't feel true anymore? What do you think that conflict was? I, I, I don't know exactly. It could be um, a combination of grief. It could be a combination of um, it not feeling fulfilling. I think I, I wasn't believing in, in certain missions anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, you know, I, I think I felt like I was more of a, our, TV news has become so much about me. Mm. And I think that I was feeling pressure to make something about me that I never really wanted to be about me. Like yeah, I, yeah. um, and, and I think, I think it was a combination, but it certainly led me to this place where I was like, okay, this is becoming very clear that the end of the road is near. And I said, um, I need to take some time off and just think about this. Yeah. And I took some time off and it was in, that time when I was sitting on my the back bed. Oh, yeah. And, and I clarity. was overwhelmed, mm -hmm. overwhelmed. And I was just like, I think it's a lot more simple than we're making it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot more meaningful than we're realizing. And I think that God has a lot more mm -hmm. for each of us. Yeah. And more becomes the central piece.
And it, yeah. Yeah. I, I want to explore something with you that, um, of all the 13 guests that I've had for this season one, I have known you by far the longest, mm -hmm. right? We met in 2011. Mm -hmm. I was already in Indianapolis just by a few months. I'd only beaten you by a few months mm -hmm. there. And then you were there just months after, right? Yeah. In d December, November, December, yep. 2011, yep. right? Yep, November. And so, you know, we started in, in this city, this particular city at the same time and, um, you know, saw through ownership changes and leadership changes and, and all the changes that that you have to weather, I think, as mm -hmm. a as an on air talent. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I always use to describe this job is that you have to pretend like things are okay when they're not okay. Yeah. So that's emotionally, uh, maybe something hop happened in your personal life, and yeah. you have to just put it away. Mm -hmm. Or maybe everything's breaking, and you can hear it in your earpiece. <laughs> everything's going wrong, mm -hmm. but you can't let people see that something's wrong. Right. And let let's talk about instead of peeling back the layers of the onion, let's talk about those things that we have to encase ourselves with being in a performance career. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to, you have to, in, you have to put on clothes that aren't yours. Yeah. You have to put on things that don't belong to you. Yeah. Uh, shave off parts of yourself to make yourself the most appealing to the most amount of people mm -hmm. and making decisions based on what other people will like, not based on what you will like. Yeah. When did you realize that that was happening to you? And how have you gone about unscrewing mm. that? <laughs> Man, that's a great question. That's that's um, a process. Yeah. Because when you build up, I like that onion analogy, because when you build up 15 years of layers, yeah. um, it's going to be a process to start to unpeel those. Uh, the first step in that is becoming aware that it even happened. Yeah, that you put on other people's stuff, right? Yeah. And you become so accustomed to it in, in TV news because it's all you've known. Mm. And so it gets to a point where you think, what do I like? Mm. Those words that that consultant told me 10 years ago that still stick with me, mm -hmm. that viewer email that said, mm -hmm. my arms are weird. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, I'm with you. No, I get crazy. it. People don't realize how like the craziest stuff. Crazy. And, and no matter how strong you are and no matter how, you know, how well you can brush it off, parts of it always stick with you. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how do you start to, to rip those off mm. and start to get down to who am I really? And it's a process, but um, I think pain plays a beautiful role in that um, mm. because it brings us to the end of ourselves. Yeah. And I think for, you know, I think we're very capable uh, in this, this business especially, but as humans in general, we're very capable of pushing through. Mm -hmm. And it takes coming to the end of ourselves and our abilities and our competencies to say, oh, I need to surrender. And it is only in surrender when we can truly see who we are made yeah. to be. Yeah. I can't tell you how long it took me to answer the simple question of what do I want? Mm. I mean, I, um, and it was this 36th year of mine has been incredibly transformative. It's been a transformative year. And there was this realization for me one day of this, of I've always been told what colors to wear, what not to wear, how to do my hair, how to do my makeup. My hair should be cut short. My hair should be long. My hair should be, have uh, blonde highlights. No, it should have red highlights. Um, don't say this, do say this. Don't laugh like that. I mean, mm. when you shave so many parts of yourself off, mm -hmm. you, you forget where you begin, where you end, where, where other people's projections are, yeah. are, you know, even sewn onto you almost. Yeah. Like instead of like, here's a Band-Aid, Lauren, to fix your wound here, I'm actually going to put another person's expectations into that mm. wound and you're going to heal into this other person that's actually more like a Frankenstein mm. and it's not actually you. Mm -hmm. So I, I think for me, that mm -hmm. transformative question was, what do I want? Yes. And, and it took me two months to answer that question. Yes. What color do I actually like to wear? And as a 36 year old woman yeah. to admit that that simple, simple question that I should have figured out at 22 or 23, I couldn't even answer. I mean, yeah. that's, that was, that was the beginning of my controlled burn. But exactly. And, and, and what was the beginning of it was probably, if I'm guessing pain, mm -hmm. some level of discomfort, pain or suffering. Yeah. Um, and that is why if everything, if everything is perfect and going great, 
we tend to just push that stuff aside mm -hmm. and keep powering forward. And so we have got to, to look at our pain. We are a society that protects against pain unlike any. I mean, we will do anything to avoid pain mm. and suffering. We will make sure we have all, you know, yeah. everything in place so that like, you know, life is good. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. <laughs> and, and it's like, I'm finding like, we have got to start embracing our pain mm. because there is purpose in it. Mm. And it's beautiful purpose. It doesn't mean it's not painful. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's not heartbreaking and even crushing. But man, if we can start shifting our perspective to look at pain with hope, um, there is transformation awaiting each of mm. us. In 2018, um, 2018 was a hard year for me. I knew I was leaving Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. I was pregnant. Uh, I had a high risk pregnancy anyway. Um, I left Indianapolis and moved here to Nashville yeah. and um, tried to put the pain of what I had left mm -hmm. in the past. At the same time, you started going through something incredibly painful. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I think, has defined so much of your journey. Mm -hmm. um, and I do want to apologize. I wasn't there for you. I'm sorry. Which this is part of why I wanted you to come. Because, hold on, I've got a tissue. I knew this would happen. If you need. I, I will. Um, <clears throat> because... So often with pain, we want to believe that we're the only one in pain. Mm. When you are in pain, in the fight of your life, in the true fight of your life, and I wasn't there for you, and I'm sorry. Lauren. So let that be the lead in to the story that you're about to tell, okay. which is like the, the absolute purpose <laughs> um, that I believe that you're here to embody and what you're here to teach, because I think it's the biggest, most beautiful lesson um, for all of us. When we say, I can't do it. I can't do mm. it. I can't make it through. Mm. I want everyone to know Brooke. Mm. Brooke made it through. Mm -hmm. Brooke made it through something so much worse than whatever this ridiculous problem is. Mm -hmm. So what was happening with you in 2018? So first of all, I just want to say, release that, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I have never, never thought about that or held that against you. Um, you have always, I, I know that you are a friend that is always there. Um, 2018 uh, was a year that we were pregnant with our second child. We had one son, Max, who was two, and um, we got pregnant. And I was about, uh, found out 12 weeks. It was right on our timeline. It was exactly what we wanted and made the announcement, of course, you know, at work um, to the viewers. Everyone was very excited. And about um, two weeks after that, I started to develop a really bad case of bronchitis. And so I just went into my OB to get some antibiotics. And while I was there, um, the nurse practitioner asked if, if I would like to sneak in and see the baby while I was there, which yeah, of course which is you so want fun, to. Right? So fun. You want the ultrasound. So fun. You want to see the baby. It already had an ultrasound, you know, like it was all good. And um, so I was, I was alone and I was in that ultrasound room when the ultrasound tech kept walking in and out and printing off something and going out. And she kept saying that the equipment's broken or something, you know, and I, I didn't think anything of it. And you, you would think I would, you know, in, mm. in our field that I would be a little like, this isn't normal. This isn't normal. Yeah. But I was just, I was oblivious, you know, I, um, I was excited and didn't think a thing of it. And, um, I have no idea how much time passed, but, um, the nurse practitioner came back in and she just put, um, her hand on my arm and she just said, I'm so sorry your baby's uh, skull is not developing and walked out and uh, I was did you I, even know what it meant like, what know, does that even mean I didn't know at all I didn't know at all I just knew it wasn't good by the look on her face yeah and um I'm laying there and I've you know got the jelly on my belly and <laughs> I'm like just in shock kind of and alone. And in the quietness of that room, I just heard Emmanuel, Emmanuel, Emmanuel over and over. 
And I honestly brushed it off because I had no idea, like, why am I thinking, why am I hearing this? You know, not audibly, but like in my heart. Didn't have any idea what it meant. I honestly, in the moment, thought, "Is like, why am I hearing like a Christmas name? You know, like this <laughs> yeah, is yeah, yeah. this is odd." And my doctor eventually made his way in, and he explained that he thinks that the, um, the diagnosis is anencephaly, and it is when your um, child's skull just does not close, and it is zero percent survival rate. Zero percent. Zero percent. There never in history has been someone who survived. No. And so. Um, I'm sitting in the ultrasound room on the chair now, and uh, it's just me and the ultrasound tech. She's kind of cleaning things up there, letting me have a moment to process. And I remember sitting there, Lauren, and I just said, excuse me, and I said, could you tell? That's all I could get out. And she knew what I was saying, and she said, it's a girl. Mm. And it was such a scary ask because I was like, do I start to love this child? Yeah. And um, my husband got there soon after. We were counseled on options and um, and he just... What, what were your options briefly? Yeah, so um, most, vast majority of these cases end in termination um, because of the 0% survival. Um, but, you know, my husband said immediately and almost shockingly to me because um, you never know how people are going to respond in situations like this. And my husband just said, we are carrying her. And it was just like, there was just no, like, I, I was so thankful mm. like, for that assertiveness yeah. in that it's, moment. It's like you didn't have to make the choice. Yes. He was strong for you. And, yes. you couldn't be. and I knew what I would have made, but I needed mm. that. I needed mm. his strength in that moment. And, um, and so that began, um, a journey for us. And I remember we, we were sitting on the couch at home and um, starting to understand that Emmanuel is God with us. That's what the name means. And it was, you know, the prophet Isaiah who prophesied and said, there will be a child and you will call him Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. And it is Christ with us. It is God with us. And through this journey of carrying a child that I knew I would not get to keep, what was the message that God was shouting from this little baby girl? And it's like, I am with you mm. and I am enough. Mm. That's a miracle. And so we walked through what seemed to be, you know, I, I had to tell the viewers because I'm not going to go seven months in a lie, you know, as I'm yeah, growing. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it wasn't out of bravery or anything that I decided to share. I just knew I couldn't. Yeah. Fake it. And um, and Cole and I were sitting on the couch and we just said, what is this for us? Like, what yeah. is this? And we just collectively looked at each other and just tears in our eyes. And we just prayed again, the most simple prayer. And it was just, God, be glorified. Mm. Like, we can't keep her. And, and she's our daughter and she's going to be with you. And so through this, just be glorified. And so I continued to anchor and I was growing and um, sharing. And it was in that process that I, um, going back to the question of shedding, yeah. I stopped posting. Like if I felt like I should have posted mm -hmm. an update and I wasn't feeling, I didn't. Yeah. If I, if I recorded something and felt like I'm not being really authentic today. Yeah. I, I deleted it. Like, I, I was like, this, this is my boundaries. And like in a controlled burn, when you're talking about it, what makes a controlled burn different from a wildfire? It has purpose. Mm. It has boundaries. And then it has beautiful regrowth. Yeah. And so like I had to learn a lot about boundaries and I had to learn about like what I'm willing to share and what I'm not. Mm. And, um, and so we walked through until her delivery date on March 15th. And what was that day like? Mm. It was a C-section, um, early morning. And um, she um, survived for 21 minutes. I got to hold her first.
I got to tell her things that I've been waiting to tell her. And then Cole held her. And the nurse said when I was talking to my anesthesiologist, she turned her head and recognized my voice. <laughs> and then she passed in Cole's arms from one father to another after 21 minutes. And um, thanks to um, a cooling device called a cuddle cot in our ho uh, hospital room, we were able to be with her for three days in my recovery. It just keeps the body. I didn't know that. Yes. Um, I am such a huge advocate of these because they're not hospital mandated. They are um, through donations and actually a family friend of ours bought hers um, that she could stay in for those three days and it's now at the hospital to use for others. But what it allows is bonding. Yeah. And, um, you know, we could take pictures with her and it was a hard three days, Lauren. Like it was just, it was just... Um, there were moments um, that were easier than others, but I mean, I remember almost sometimes being scared to look at her and just scared of, of my own emotions, like yeah. that you, you know, emotions that you've never had to feel. Yeah. And um, she was so beautiful and my biggest regret we had, you know, professional pictures and stuff, but nothing. But, like, the third day, she was just so peaceful. Her, mm. like, features had just settled, and but her lips were purple. Mm. And so I didn't take a picture of her because I was scared that that would scare me, looking back. Man, I wish I would have taken the picture. But it was the moment uh, when the morning that we were supposed to leave the hospital and um, it was the day I had been dreading my entire yeah. pregnancy. Because you knew you, there'd be a point, right? You'd, that you'd have to let her go. How do you leave how do you leave a hospital without your child? Yeah. Seems really cruel. And um, I woke up that morning with tears already streaming down my cheeks I don't yeah. and um and I just remember saying to God I can't like this is this is it like I can't do this part yeah um it's too hard I literally felt like my body was going to break mm. from the weight of it yeah and um and just like that I just felt this swell of strength like a lion just, I mean, overcome, just peace. And I took a deep breath and I knew I could do it. And, um, and so Cole and I rocked her and uh, said goodbye and handed her to a nurse. And um, we left and we got into the car and I, I will never remember, we just looked at each other and we just smiled. And it was like, this is miracle. Like this is the stuff that miracles are made of. People say, you know, oh, aren't you sad? Like, did you pray for a miracle? Did you pray? And it's like, I believe with everything in me that if God, if it was God's plan, he could have healed her. I believe that. But my focus is not on the miracle. It's on the miracle worker. Mm -hmm. And when your focus is there, everything is a miracle. I mean, everything that you walk through is a miracle. And, it, and it's just, it was the most hard, heartbreaking, but beautiful mm. journey because I learned that God is with, that God is enough. I faced death mm. in the eyes and it didn't take me down. I walked through the fire. It didn't burn me. Mm. In fact, I would say that I am stronger. I am more resolute and I believe in a personal and intimate God that has more for us than we can ever fathom but will we go there yeah will we allow ourselves and for me it took something really really hard yeah that continues to be hard continues to be hard yeah but we have a 
daughter, Marlo now, yeah. who is 18 months um, and has been a beautiful, you know, redemption story for us. Um, God, yeah. What was that pregnancy like? I mean, because the point that, the point that you, um, I mean, I, I imagine you knew all along that you wanted to have another child or yeah. was that a process? To um, no, I did. I knew, um, you know, we knew we wanted a sibling for Max and, um, and I, I, I just felt in my soul that like, you needed that too. Yeah. To know that it was going to be yeah. okay. And, so. and I felt, I felt like that. Yeah. I didn't want to, you know, I used to ride horse and as a kid, when yeah. I would get, you know, thrown off, my dad would always say, get back on. Yeah. Right. That's right? the best lesson. <laughs> get back on. And so I didn't want fear to have it's the final say of that, you yeah. know? Um, however, um, the, the pregnancy, I, I was waiting for the, the other shoe to drop, you know, every checkup, every, you're just like, Oh, mm. waiting for that news. Because once you're scarred with news like that, right. you know, it's just natural to protect. Um, so it was, um, and I, and I think I honestly did not probably bond with Marlo, um, as quickly as I did with Max, just because of that, you know, mm. the emotional protection. Did you, th do you think that you were so scared that she'd be taken? Um, I don't think I was scared that she would be taken, but I just wasn't ever confident in like, in anything that I had assumed would happen because, you know, that's how I was walking with Emma was just yeah. absolute, you know, I just assumed everything was going to be fine. And so I just, I lost that ability to assume, which is oh, probably good yeah. and bad. That's good though. But yeah, I mean, I, I just, I don't think I was scared of it, but I, I was certainly aware of the possibility. Yeah. Mm. More than I had been. But. And so after Marlo's birth, yeah. you know, you have a beautiful, healthy daughter. And then mm -hmm. at that point you have two beautiful, healthy children. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, after you've walked through this, I mean, just you've walked through death, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and here you are maybe becoming more and more disillusioned with your, um, with your employment, right? Yeah. Like with the thing that you've wanted to do for so mm -hmm. long. I, I wonder how that was for you. Mm -hmm. Did, did what you went through with Emma Noel, did it make the transition, the choice, that heavy, hard choice that you had to make to leave a career you've worked your mm. entire adult life for? Mm -hmm. Did that experience make that choice more clear? Or did it make it more difficult? More clear. I believe seeds were planted in that season that um, were starting to sprout when I started feeling that things were, you know, shifting inside of me. Um, it was it was sprouts from things that, that were planted that gave me just incredible perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I say that suffering has a purifying perspective. <laughs> That's and, a nice spin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, because it really burns away, um, the, the stuff that, that seems to just kind of keep us going in, in the, the rat race that we think life is. Mm. And, um, and so I got to a point where I was just like, yeah, there's, there's more here. Mm. And I said to Cole one, at one point, I said, I would be willing to sell our house and move into an apartment on, you know, another side of town if it meant that I could stay true mm. to what I feel like my life needs to be about now. Mm. And that was a really freeing thing where I let go of things that I had strived so hard for yeah. and realized that just because, and, and I don't, I don't look back and regret, you know, my career or even the striving. Like, I think there's healthy things to, to working hard and achieving, but you have to be willing to let it go if it's mm. time or else yeah. your dreams become your prisons. Mm. Pretty cages, huh? They're yes. pretty, 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 very pretty, but a cage, very pretty. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a, a monster that only has increased appetite. Mm. You're never satisfied. And so what is the thing that is satisfying in life? And what did you determine that is? My purpose of mm. glorifying God. Yeah. So let's talk about what you've created. You know, that word yeah. more kept coming more. to you, didn't it? It did. Yeah. And, and, and I just thought, hey, I'm on this journey I'm not claiming to know it all. <laughs> I'm not claiming to be an expert, but I know that I have found something here. Mm. 
in that time where I took off from work, I started changing habits. Mm. I started um, changing my routines and what I did with my time. I put technology mostly away. Mm. And for a TV news person, you know, who is constantly attached to it. Well, and people need to understand it's actually part of our job. It we is. are required to be on social media. There are post mandates, post this many times a day, schedule this post. I mean, it's yeah. it, that. <laughs> yeah. I could not, I hate that more than anything. Same. I've, I have just really bucked the trend the last few months in the same reason, like I've got it and my head is not and yeah. in the social. It's just no. not there. And no. it's not true or authentic. I can't do it. And it depletes you. It, it depletes, totally depletes your soul. You. Um, and so I had to really rework my, my thoughts and my perspectives on a lot of things, including rest. What is rest? Mm. Why are we resting and still feeling? I mean, it says that our generation, especially millennials, is the most um, overwhelmed unfulfilled generation and yet they have the most access to leisure activities and and rest um, avenues as far as you know netflix and all you know mm. all the things at their fingertips and they're the most stressed and overwhelmed why is that we don't know we don't know how we're getting it wrong yeah we're getting rest wrong and rest is completely different from leisuring and what i learned is leisuring is resting at the expense of someone else. Mm. Someone, if you go to a restaurant, it's someone's working for you. If you're watching a football game, now if you're playing a football game in your backyard, <laughs> you're resting. Yeah. If you're cooking your own food, you're resting in that if you enjoy that. If you're just spending time, you're resting, your soul mm. is filled. And so I'm, I just started like making these changes in, in my life, in our family's life. And I was like, oh, it was almost mm. like I was being revived. Because suddenly you were doing things that you just kind of wanted to do, right? Yes. You allowed yourself to... You, you just allowed that self-reflection, didn't you? That moment yeah. to say, well, what, what is it that I actually enjoy? Yeah. Not what I've been told to enjoy or told to do or, right. you know. And, and, you know, now I had time. I had time to process. And, you know, before, I mean, the, the work schedule, especially with young kids, is brutal. And so you, you get to the weekends and you have your to-do list and then you got to do this. And then, you know, and, and we implemented, um, you know, ancient um, practices of Sabbath. So like a full 24 hours of truly being, doing nothing, putting nothing on our calendar, mm. you know, being with each other, having technology take a back seat. I mean, things that you go back to and you're like, this isn't like weird rules and regular, this is for our thriving. Yeah, yeah. And there's a reason for it. And so I just started to like unearth like some of these things that I'm like, yeah, we, we've kind of like thought we, we got it, yeah, right? Yeah, we thought we figured it out like and we've, we've messed it up. <laughs> right. And, and you know, it's kind of interesting because like for us, we, we come from maybe the, the first real generation that women can do it all mm, and we can, yeah. Yeah. and, and it's a beautiful gift, but what we've done I think in turn is almost take it too far and just say, not only can we, I must do yeah, it all. Yeah. And, and that's not necessarily true if that's not where God is calling you into. Right. And so um, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse. And I think we have to start unpacking some of that and say, am I okay yeah. not doing it all? Right. And even maybe just for this time period, you know? Um, but, but am I okay taking a back seat in this? And, and I have found that I am more than okay in that. Well, it, what's interesting is like your version of back seat is is almost like it's propelled you even further. Do you feel that way? In what way? I feel like here here's here's been my experience. When a person decides to connect with purpose, male, female, 25 year old, 55 year old, doesn't matter. When a person decides to connect with purpose, when when they say this is about the we, Mm -hmm. This is not about the me. Mm -hmm. When they get out of their own way, when they let ego step aside and they begin to serve others or just make it about something bigger, mm -hmm. there's something about that that it's like suddenly you got on the express train mm -hmm. to whatever, whatever, whatever it is that, yeah. that the universe, that God, that destiny has in store for you. You just hopped on the express train because for in my view, People who hop on that express train to purpose get to 
success, get to, I mean, having all their needs met, get to whatever it is that they really desired through other means, but couldn't get because that wasn't the purpose train. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. so you were in television, yeah. a, a main female anchor in a large market, and you'd done that for years and years and years, mm -hmm. but there's something that's so much more resonant when you decided to get on that express mm -hmm. purpose train. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's my, from the seat I'm sitting in looking at you. Do yeah. you feel that or do you feel it's been a different experience for you? Um, I think that's to be determined, <laughs> you know? I, it's I, only new, right? Yeah. Only a few months new. And, and what I've had to do is take my expectations out of it. And that's hard for me. Um, I've had to say, look, God, like you have so clearly been in this from the very beginning to the launch of the website to all yeah. of this. And now I kind of, you know, got to a point where I was like, well, now what? Yeah. And I had to say, well, this is where faith starts mm. playing. Mm. It's where the road, you can't see what's ahead. Yeah. And you say, but you know what? I've trusted you this far. Yeah. You're not going to let me down now. You, you stared down death. Why would you, why would you second guess now? You're bulletproof. And so I can walk into this. I mean, there's, there's so many implications to this. I mean, financial insecurity, you know, like just new territories that our family has never had to walk through. And yet we're standing and we're going, yep, bring it. Yeah. Bring it. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay because we've walked through it and we yeah. know that because we are living in the purpose of finding out who we are supposed to be, God is never mm. going to disappoint us in that. Yeah. And that's freeing. Yeah. It's, it's not freedom. It's not faith if you can see it. Yeah. Right? It yeah. has to be unseen. Yeah. And, you know, and it's just, it's fun. That's the other thing. I mean, it's fun not knowing. It's scary, <laughs> but it's also fun because, you know, he just shows up in ways that you're just like, you know, the same God who whispered Emmanuel in that ultrasound room to me is the same God who's leading me into this next journey. Mm. I, I can't imagine not having that relationship. Yeah. It, it's just, it's been the, the biggest gift in my life. And I think it was my eyes were opened to it through a little girl. Mm. And I think that that is, you know, her, her life's message is that God is with us and each of us mm. and available. But so many times we have to come to the end of ourselves before we mm. are willing to reach out. Right. Do you think, um, purpose can exist in a vacuum apart from spirituality or do you think they have to be connected? It absolutely can exist. My question would be, is it temporal? Mm. Is it fleeting? Um, and, and that's kind of just what I've had to, to wrestle with and why yeah. I feel like, I feel like the people least concerned with purpose are the ones knitted closest to God because it's more like they're too consumed doing the next thing that he has, mm. that purpose becomes a given. Yeah. I mean, it just is. It just is. It's your being again, being overdoing. Mm. And so absolutely people can have many different purposes, beautiful purposes. Mm. Um, but if, if it is self-driven, self-powered, um, all of us are human and yeah. there will be limits to that. Um, whereas faith-driven purpose, I believe is infinite, yeah. eternal and powerful. How do you, how do you, mm -hmm. Brooke Martin, mm -hmm. how do you know uh, when you're doing something in purpose, does it feel different to you versus when Brooke Martin's making a Brooke Martin choice? Mm, yes. Okay. Yes. How does that feel? Um, it's being connected. I, you know, it, it is the lifeline and, um, so many days, you know, what I try to do every morning is spend time. I try and spend an hour of just sitting in the presence of God and hearing from him and just what is, what does it look like? What does today look like? What is, you know, and it is amazing how many times somebody will come to mind or, you know, that I'm just supposed to reach out to, or uh, an idea. Like mm -hmm. I love dreaming with God. Like I get awesome ideas <laughs> that, you know, I love implementing and, and, and using my creativity with. And so that is, that is when I know that I'm, I'm going through that. I'm the conduit there mm -hmm. as opposed to, self-motivating. And, you know, it doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that I'm not, I'm, I'm missing out on the power. Yeah. I, you know, I, 
we, we like to think that we have the ability to do it all. And, um, and what happens is we burn out and, yeah. you know, and it's like, we have got to be filled before we can pour into others. Mm. And what happens is like, if you don't get filled first, you start to feel empty right. and burn out. Even if you're doing a good thing, yeah. even if it, the purpose is good, you've got to be filled first. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh my gosh. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for making the trip. And, this and is just all such a way. joy. And, you know, I've told you this before, but um, you're doing something really important with this. And I want you just to, to walk this out in confidence and assurance, knowing that your giftings are really valuable. So love you, friend. Thanks, sis. Yeah. Appreciate it. Mm. So what'd you think? Tell me in the comments below, like it, share it with someone who needs to hear it. I'm adding new videos all the time to help you reconnect with self and then prepare for purpose. And since you're here, I've gone ahead and linked my playlist, the episode Amplified. It gives shorter clips from each episode, still though very much power packed with encouragement. It's all right here. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.